When and where were you born? I was born in Boone, Iowa, August the 8th, 1931. Makes me 83 recently. Okay. Your parents' names? Uh, my parents' name was John. My father's name was John. My mother's name was Olga, O-L-G-A. She was from Sweden. My father was from Boone, Iowa. Um, we lived in Boone until I was maybe five years old when my father moved to Michigan to be part of the Dow Chemical Company in Midland. Uh, education was always foremost in his mind, and that was what he was determined for me. And since you're mentioning my father, I might just comment that he was had to quit school in the freshman year of Iowa State to support the family because of the Depression promised himself that someday he would get a college degree, enrolled in LSU at age 66 after he finished with wow. the Dow Chemical Company. And I think it's true that he's still the oldest graduate from LSU, receiving his BA degree from LSU and when he was 72 years old. Wonderful, wonderful. And your mother have any formal uh, education other than uh, high school? Did she <coughs> have any My mother had a high school education. and. Mm -hmm was largely a stay-at-home mom. Okay. Which is a full-time job. <laughs> <laughs> right. Brothers, sisters? Have a sister who graduated from Rice, as I did, and lived in Houston. Worked for the um, AT&T telephone company in Houston. Unfortunately, she expired early this year okay. of breast cancer. Terrible disease. Children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. You don't have to name them all, by the way. <laughs> I have four children, 13 grandchildren, two great-grandchildren. About to have two more great-grandchildren. Wonderful. So it's a large family at Christmas time. Yes. Any in the field of medicine? No. Um, and that's kind of an interesting thing to comment on. They told me that they simply didn't want to work that hard. Okay. So they pursued other activities. Uh, you, you married now? Married now, been it, married for 45 years. Wife's name? Wife's name is Nancy. Nancy was the head operating nurse in plastic surgery at the University of Virginia. And we became married uh, after I finished my residency in plastic surgery there. What year? 1964. Okay. So the chief of the program at uh, University of Virginia at that time was? was Claude C. Coleman, Jr. Okay. All right. Harry Muller was professor of surgery. Right, okay. And then from there you went to? And from there I went to Hopkins for four years where I was on the faculty. Um, George Zydema was the chairman of the Department of Surgery. Milt Edgerton was the chairman of the Division of Plastic Surgery. Uh, a fellow named Walter Ballinger was Dr. Zydema's right-hand person in the Department of Surgery. Walter went to Washington University in St. Louis to become chairman of surgery. Uh, shortly after he got there, they were looking for a chief of plastic surgery. and courted me and in that I was replacing James Barrett Brown, who was in fact one of the founding fathers of plastic surgery. I felt that was an opportunity that could not be turned down. So in 1968, we moved to St. Louis and I became chief of plastic surgery there. It was my intention to remain there forever. Two years later, Milt retired at Hopkins. Hopkins asked me to please come back and be chairman at Hopkins. I went to medical school at Hopkins. I fell in love with Hopkins as a medical student. And I simply could not even consider not returning to Hopkins. So although it was a disappointment to a lot of people at St. Louis and to an extent a disappointment to me to quit after two years, so to speak, I felt compelled to return to Hopkins and did in 1970. So you were their franchise player. <laughs> if you want to use a, a football or basketball yeah, that's expression. That's probably correct. So they brought you back. How did you go into plastic? I, I, I don't want to miss that. I, we, uh, 
I went to medical school at Hopkins and I was on the residency training program at Hopkins for two years with Dr. Blaylock and Dr. Bonson and Frank Spencer and all those guys. Um, went to the University of Mississippi in Jackson to finish my general surgery training. Uh, a very, very busy general surgery program in Jackson, Mississippi. I don't know how many gallbladders and gastrectomies and leg amputations and everything else I did and was invited by the largest and I guess best practicing general surgery group in Jackson to join them in private practice when I finished. It seemed to me as early as that point in time, which was 1962, general surgery was still, was on the verge of no longer becoming general surgery. Um, it was becoming abdominal and emergency room surgery it had a repertoire of surgical procedures. I could not envision spending the rest of my career doing a repertoire of surgical procedures, which I could, would consider to be very uninteresting and unexciting. Um, have to go back to a point in time when I was a resident at Hopkins, and a guy named Rainey Williams was Dr. Blaylock's chief resident in general surgery. Rainey was the most gentlemanly surgeon I've ever known and probably the best technical surgeon I've ever known. Duncan McKee had stayed on as Dr. Edgerton's assistant following completion of his training in plastic surgery. I was so influenced by both of those guys that plastic surgery was always in the back of my mind, especially due to Duncan. And I'll simply comment at this point in time that I was I guess quite impressionable as a young man because I named my youngest son Duncan Rainey Hoops after Duncan McKee and Rainey Williams. Um, but fundamentally to answer your question, I, I wanted something more exciting and more innovative and more challenging than general surgery and plastic surgery was it. Well, you told me about who inspired you to go into plastic surgery. Did, did you name a few of your mentors? I read your, our, your uh, presidential address in the, the Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Journal, but I'd like to hear about people that have been influential in your life and sentinel in your life. Well, I've already mentioned Duncan McKee and Rainey Williams. That was early in my career. Uh, I've always been interested in plastic surgeons older than I to see what they thought about and how they came to be what they were and have always therefore sort of sought mentors to answer your question. When I went to St. Louis, the plastic surgeons in St. Louis at the time were Barrett Brown, an icon in plastic surgery, uh, Bill Byers, Frank McDowell, who left to become editor of the Plastic Surgery Journal, and mine at Fryer, and in terms of mentors, Bill Byers and I became close friends. Mm -hmm. And during my time in St. Louis, Bill and I would sit on his front porch discussing various aspects of plastic surgery and how he came to be, who he was, and what he did. And unfortunately, Bill was dying of widespread metastatic prostate cancer at the time. So we, we lost a great icon in Bill, but he was a mentor. Mm -hmm. Um, when I got back to Baltimore, I became very close friends with a lumps and bumps, if you will, plastic surgeon in Baltimore named Bobby Johnson. Bobby lived in, ba ba Bobby's family lived in Baltimore forever. And Bobby lived on one of the last remaining land grants from the King of England uh, and owned the property. Bobby simply was a very wise, very worldly guy who gave me all kinds of good advice. And when things got sticky at Hopkins and I was feeling down and out and needed somebody to talk to, I'd go talk to Bobby. And another mentor was a prominent Baltimore lawyer named C. Eddie Jones, who uh, had come up the hard way, so to speak, but was a fantastic student of human nature and if I wasn't talking to Bobby about solving some of my problems, I'd go talk to Eddie. So um, they were not plastic surgery mentors, but they certainly were mentors mm -hmm. as far as guiding me through the, some of the difficulties. In your opinion, what is the most important innovation in our specialty today? Uh, 
Well, I pointed out to you that I have not had much to do with plastic surgery for 24 years now, so that has to flavor some of my comments. But as far as I can see, microvascular surgery was the greatest innovation. And I enjoyed being partially involved in that, in that one of my residents, Pat Maxwell, went out to see Harry Bunke very early in the development of microvascular surgery. Uh, created a wonderful movie on latissimus dorsi free flap breast reconstruction when he came back from Bunky's program. And of course Andy Lee at Hopkins now is doing microvascular surgery for all manner of extraordinary transplantation work. Um, it's hard to choose between microvascular surgery and craniofacial surgery as developed by Tessier and musculocutaneous flap surgery yeah. as developed by John McCraw and Carl Hartram. But um, I would think microvascular surgery would be the greatest innovation. What do you think has been the greatest mistake that our specialty has made? Well, I was very much involved being the chief at Hopkins and, and involved in all of the National Plastic Surgery Societies of, of being involved in the politics of plastic surgery and the advancement of plastic surgery as a specialty and what have you. And I think the greatest mistake plastic surgery made was not having a well-formulated, well-accepted national strategy for plastic surgery. Um, I mentioned to you our travel club, which has been meeting for 45 years now. But it appears, it seemed to our travel club that orthopedic surgery, for example, had a major national strategy, and that was departmental status on the one hand and capturing hand surgery on the other hand. And our travel club was so impressed with orthopedist national strategy that we invited the executive director of orthopedic surgery to come meet with us as a travel club and tell us what they were doing and how they were going about it. Um, by the same token, otolaryngology had a national strategy. And it had several components. One was that they were going to capture head and neck surgery, which they did. Another was that there was a national strategy in otolaryngology back in the 1960s that no academic young otolaryngologist was to accept appointment as chairman of the Department of, Otolar of Otolaryngology without it becoming a department. Oh. And in the late 1960s, they, as far as I was aware, stuck to that and they simply depended departmental status for otolaryngology or they would not accept the appointment. And I think that advanced their specialty dramatically. And finally, the thing that upset me, I guess as much as anything, was we should have protected the term plastic surgery. Um, everybody began calling themselves plastic surgeons. When I was chairman of the American Board of Plastic Surgery, that concept of everybody using the term plastic surgery upset me so much that I arranged a joint meeting of the American Board of Otolaryngology and the American Board of Plastic Surgery. We met here in Chicago. I introduced the fundamental topic as being, why are you guys calling yourselves plastic surgeons? And their response was, we don't call ourselves plastic surgeons. And I said, well, here is the Chicago telephone book, and mm -hmm. here are all of the otolaryngologists under a plastic surgery. Um, I wish the American Board of Medical Specialties or the American College of Surgeons or the AAMC or somebody had established some guidelines about who are plastic surgeons and who are not. Um, and I think it was a terrible mistake to let that get away from us, so to speak. I think we should have controlled plastic surgery. What do you feel is your greatest professional accomplishment? Um, George Zydema was the chairman of surgery when I was at Hopkins. And Milt Edgerton was the chairman of plastic surgery during my period there from 64 to 68. Both Dr. Zydema and Dr. Edgerton felt that there was no need for part-time faculty in plastic surgery. Um, they both felt very strongly that only academic full-time plastic surgeons should be directing the training of residents and 
uh, I felt precisely the opposite. I felt that any individual doing plastic surgery, any plastic surgeon, almost regardless of his qualifications, could teach the resident something. Um, I felt that to an extent, plastic surgeons who were doing the wrong things mm -hmm. could teach residents about that as much as plastic surgeons doing outstanding things. So I focused while I was at Hopkins on collecting all of the resources available for the teaching of residents in Baltimore to train the residents in plastic surgery. Um, I incorporated the Raymond Curtis Hand Center into the training program. Okay. I incorporated the head and neck service at Greater Baltimore Medical Center into the training program. Mm -hmm. and Bob Chambers, who did essentially all of the head and neck cancer surgery in Baltimore, was part of our program. I incorporated uh, the shock trauma unit at mm -hmm. the University of Maryland, run by R. Adams Cowley, into the program, and our residents began rotating to shock trauma. And finally, at, toward the end, I succeeded in making the University of Maryland part of the program. So the program became the combined Hopkins University of Maryland program in plastic surgery. Um, I think I had something like 25 part-time faculty on the, sta on the staff. Mm -hmm. And they all came to Grand Rounds in plastic surgery. They all had some comments to make appropriately. Uh, and I felt that that really enhanced the training of residents and I would consider that my accomplishment and my contribution. Okay, your greatest professional disappointment. We, 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 we do the disappointment. We did the joy. So, no, yeah, your greatest professional disappointment. Okay. Well, without question, my greatest professional disappointment was I fought for 20 years at Hopkins to make plastic surgery department. Um, orthopedics had become a department at Hopkins. Otolaryngology had become a department at Hopkins. Urology had become... Um, I used every argument I could think of to persuade the dean and the chairman of the Department of Surgery and everybody else that plastic surgery deserved to be a department. Um, and simply, regardless of my activities, could not accomplish that. The argument seemed entirely inappropriate to me from the chairman of the Department of Surgery and from the dean that they could not, that general mm -hmm. surgery could not survive without the income from cardiac surgery and plastic surgery. And if I, they made plastic surgery a department, the argument was that they would have to make cardiac surgery a department. And they simply could not do that because general surgery could not survive on its own financially. Um, so it comes down friend, to follow the money. <laughs> a very good friend of mine named Bruce Wrights was Chief of Cardiac Surgery at Hopkins, Bruce and I tried together to achieve independence. Bruce finally gave up and went to UCLA as Chief of Cardiac Surgery at UCLA. Um, Paul Manson succeeded me. Um, and the argument General Surgery used in addition to the money was that if we make you a department, this was to Paul, uh, we, of course, have got to appoint a search committee for a department chairman. Um, and nobody who was in the position of being the chief wanted a search committee appointed. What's been your greatest joy? Be anything. Um, well, I have several greatest joys. My greatest joy is being, and it sounds, my greatest joy is being a plastic surgeon. Um, for 30 some years of being in plastic surgery, and I mm. tell my residents this, I never once referred to going to the hospital as going to work. Um, for me, it was not going to work. I remained incredulous for several years after I finished training that I was still getting paid for something I enjoyed doing so much. <laughs> um, Plastic surgery was my life to a large extent. I loved every minute of it. I was challenged by it. I loved teaching the residents. Um, so my greatest joy was simply being a plastic surgeon. And I sort of hope that young plastic surgeons today are aware of the privilege they have of being a plastic surgeon and take advantage of it because it is a, it's a wonderful feeling. It's a wonderful sense of, uh, and my other two joys, not to interrupt you, would yeah. be 
I established a lectureship in scientific surgery, so to speak, at Hopkins. And the concept was that I wanted them, them, since I wasn't there anymore, to invite someone each year, ideally not a plastic surgeon, but a researcher in whatever, transplantation mm -hmm. or whatever, <coughs> or a medical ethicist or somebody who would contribute to the training of pla and education of plastic sur young plastic surgery residents. And ideally, I wanted it set up in such a way that it was not conducted in the Department of Surgery, it was conducted in the university at large, and it would attract all manner of interested individuals, not only plastic surgeons. Okay. Um, that has been a wonderful experience for me because it's been going on for 20-some years now. Who was the last lecturer? Uh, I haven't been to a lecture in a couple of years, and I the don't remember week. who the last lecture was. The, next, the lecture of this year, and the lecture I think is on October the 22nd, is a woman whose name I don't remember from England who apparently is an outstanding transplantation surgeon internationally. And since that's what Andy Lee does, mm -hmm. that's why she was mm -hmm. invited. And the second thing would be the foundation in plastic surgery. And the residents and all of my associates and all of my patients and friends wanted to establish something in my name when I retired. And they said they wanted ideally to contribute to an endowed chair in plastic surgery. Um, this may sound like str strange reasoning, but being at Hopkins for so long and being involved so much in the financial activities of Hopkins, my experience was that money contributed to Hopkins had a way of disappearing down a rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. um, I did, and the example I tell my residents was that a very good friend of mine who was a cardiac surgeon at Hopkins years ago was hired by Dr. Blaylock and told his salary would be $14,000 a year. He informed Dr. Blaylock that he had a Markle scholarship. Uh, and Dr. Blaylock said, how much is the Markle scholarship? And he said, well, they're gonna pay me $7,000 a year. And Dr. Blaylock said, in that case, your salary will be $7,000 a year. Um, that, I think, to a large extent, is the way universities work. Mm -hmm. And absent plastic surgery being a department at Hopkins, I did not want the money contributed to an endowed chair until it was a department, and therefore established a foundation with the yeah. money. Yeah. It contributed $250,000 to the academic scholar program of the association. And various people have told me that the academic scholar program of the association probably is the major innovation in plastic surgery over the past many decades. Um, and now it is contributing money to the development of a curriculum in plastic surgery. But its entire focus all is on improving the education of plastic surgery residents. Okay. We're always down our list, and I, one of these you, uh, you, you've kind of touched on, and who did you admire, admire most professional or personal? Uh, you mentioned some people as we went down, but if you want to... I gave a lot of thought to that question, and admiration's an interesting thing. The people I have admired the most, and again, I go back to wanting to know the older plastic surgeons and how, what they did and why they did it. But the people I admired the most over all the time I spent in plastic surgery were the hardworking, um, plastic surgeons who did not have personal goals and were not politically ambitious and were simply happy to do their job and, and be approved or not approved for what they did. And I felt exceedingly strongly that good work is going to be rewarded and that should be the goal as opposed to seeking a political position or seeking advancement in the National Plastic Surgery Society. And therefore, people like Steve Lewis from Galveston and Dave Robinson and from Kansas City and those guys really, really impressed me as being the stalwarts in our, in our mm. specialty and I looked up to all of them. Would you give us your words of wisdom for present and future generations of plastic surgeons? Um, well, if I, from my point of view, I guess, it's the, the major word of wisdom I would offer is have the courage of your convictions. Um, 
There were lots of things that I wished I had done in plastic surgery, but one tends to get involved in political decisions and one tends to get involved or not involved with movements of one kind or another. Um, I think we all basically know what is the right thing to do, but it's easy to be moved off of the right thing to do in terms of achieving some other kind of goal. And I wish that I had had the courage of my convictions all the way through the, my professional career because I knew what was right to do, but I sometimes didn't do it. And that's what I would advise young plastic surgeons to do. Okay. Uh, your, your words of wisdom for retirement. Um, Sir William Osler, who was the first professor of medicine at Hopkins, wrote a wonderful little book called Equanimitas. And I've read it any number of times. The fundamental message in that book was live your life in day-tight compartments. Um, and I have tried my best to adhere to that in retirement. During the first few years, I worried about the political decisions I had made in plastic surgery and what I should have done differently. During the first few years, I worried about the complications I had had in plastic surgery and how could I have prevented those. Um, that accomplishes nothing, living in the past. And I now, and my wife emphasizes this to me frequently, live my life in daytight compartments and tomorrow is, yesterday is gone and tomorrow is not here yet. And be happy with what you have and yeah. pursue what you enjoy. All right. Okay. Um, okay, predictions for plastic surgery in the next quarter century. Uh, I guess I would make two predictions. One, I think, is that aesthetic surgery is going to continue to explode. Um, more and more and more people are going to be seeking aesthetic surgery and more and more surgeons are going to be doing aesthetic surgery. Uh, I don't know whether I want to see it or not, but somehow there's going to have to be a program for training aesthetic surgeons, limited to the training of aesthetic surgery. Uh, whether that happens or not, I don't know, but Lord knows many, many, many plastic surgeons limit their practices to nothing but aesthetic surgery, and I think that is going to be even more true in the future. Um, my second prediction would be that no, bo no one is better trained to do the broad spectrum of surgery than plastic surgeons because of microvascular surgery and muscutaneous flap surgery and cranial face surgery. And I've been predicting, I predicted even when I was working, that when the transplantation rejection issues finally become completely resolved, plastic surgeons are going to be the ideally trained surgeons to take over. And I would feel that almost any surgical procedure that can be envisioned can be accomplished. And plastic surgeons are going to be the people who do okay. that. Wonderful. Okay. Um, is there, I'm, I was going to, and I discussed with you about finishing up this interview with a presidential address, a paragraph that I'm going to read part of and ask you to read the second part of to finish the interview. This is from the Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Journal, 1990, John Hoops, MD, and it was uh, at the annual meeting of the American Association of Plastic Surgeons. And the title was Growing Up. And that was in 1990, so we've all grown up a little bit uh, from then, I hope, to some extent. The paragraph starts out, all surgeons instinctively seek shelter within a back-to-basics philosophy when confronted with previously unexplored territory. And I, you, have contemplated my experience as a medical educator in hopes of assisting you in identifying some guiding principles. I have not succeeded in formulating universal truths, but I have arrived at the conclusion that the natural product of maturation, self-sufficiency, is highly desirable. And I'd ask you to read the last six lines starting with all of us. All of us nurture the transformation of a medical school graduate into a self-sufficient, responsible physician. 
All of us are hopeful that the blood, sweat, and tears devoted to the construction of comprehensive residency training programs will not be washed away and that the programs can survive in a self-sufficient manner on the basis of merit alone. All of us must realize that our specialty has matured into adulthood and that our specialty must accept both the reward and the responsibility of self-sufficiency.